because I'm a psychologist and I deal with clients. Um, I'm also, I deal with celebrities, so I do a lot of uh, celebrity coaching. So when a celebrity is a meltdown or has some sort of difficulty, uh, they're too upset to carry on with a tour or whatever it is, their agents refer them to me and I give them an hour's coaching. Uh, I have to deal with Piers Morgan on Good Morning Britain, so that's one of the most difficult clients you'll ever have to deal with. <laughs> Um, I also do a lot of work as well as on TV behind the scenes, so I work with reality TV contestants, so assessing them for their suitability, their robustness to go on TV shows, um, and also supporting them the duty of care through the TV process. So I, I sort of see all manner of difficult clients, if you like, some of which... Um, I can choose to see another which I can't. I mean, also in my dating and relationship coaching, you know, I will get single clients who come along for dating coaching who are very resistant to change, um, even though they've paid me good money to come along and get my advice. Uh, and couples very often where, and I'm sure you probably see this to a degree in your own world, where one is really gung-ho about having some relationship counselling and the other one looks as though they have been dragged there kicking and screaming uh, and think they're a failure or couldn't see a, a worse thing to do than actually do relationship counselling. Um, so, so I want to go through, um, I suppose, the key points, firstly, in uh, noticing when a client might be difficult to please, how to deal with them, uh, you know, what you do when a client's taking up an inordinate amount of your time or is never pleased with anything you do. Um, but before I do that, and then obviously how to deal with them if you do have them, but I think it's worth thinking about the, the impact that troublesome clients have on your own business. I mean, they can be very demanding, they have very high expectations, uh, more than can ever be achieved, take valuable time and professionalism away from your other clients, obviously. But, you know, what happens to you as planners and organisers and all the things you do, bakers, in a psychological way when you have a difficult client on your books? So one of the problems with having a difficult client is that hostilities develop quickly. Some of this might resonate with some of you who've had uh, awkward clients in the past. Um, that then leads to things like confrontations and arguments. But more than that, it saps your own self-confidence and self-belief in your job. Um, I call it gaslighting. It's a very popular term in the media now. Um, but troublesome clients can almost psychologically manipulate you into believing that your own perception or your own way of doing things or your own thoughts about it are not correct. They sow seeds of doubt in your mind that actually you're doing the wrong thing or you're not doing good and, you know, well enough. Uh, maybe it's your fault you're not doing a good enough job for them. And that is really demoralising. Um, but people can be quite skilled when you're absolutely at pains to do the best job you can for them for making you kind of feel unworthy. Um, and that, you know, that in my mind is a difficult client. Um, so it also, gaslighting shifts the power dynamic between your bride or your groom or your couple, which might have been a well-balanced one. Um, and it changes that power balance into them thinking they're running the show, you feel guilty, you're running after their every whim, you know, just to keep up with them. And, and the whole thing is a fairly miserable experience from the moment that happens and that's not what anybody wants obviously um, so going the extra mile for brides grooms that you have good rapport with is one thing but running yourself ragged for someone who's effectively bullying you into submission especially at the cost of compromising your usual high standards for your other clients uh, is something else altogether leaves you exhausted unfulfilled unworthy and just that feeling that you lack the competence to your job at all. So spotting a difficult client at an early stage, which is kind of key, because you may not want to keep that client, but you need to recognise, you may or may not want to keep them, but you need to recognise what they might be like. I mean, some difficult clients are very easy to spot at a very early stage. They're rude, they try and rush you, they express resistance that they ever needed, a planner or organiser at all. They might ask you to prove your credentials, a sort of innocent 
till proven guilty type thing. Um, they might even give the impression that they could do your job better than you. Uh, they might come with a very long, precise list of requirements, which they can't be moved from, but they want it at a bargain price, or have absolutely no idea what they wanted in the first place and procrastinate over every suggestion, helpful suggestion, that you try and make. Um, all these are red flags, in my view, um, for whatever underlying reason, the anxieties that they may have about anything, uh, they're not going to be straightforward um, to work with. And I assume you also get couples sometimes who, who disagree with each other, so they're not working in harmony either. I did just want to tell you one story about, actually, about my most difficult client uh, and how I dealt with it. So I had a man come to me who wanted dating coaching. He was single man in his early 50s. Uh, he paid for three sessions. So people come to me and either have one session, one coaching session, they can pay for a three session package or a six session package. He paid for three. He came along, talked to him about his life, what was his, you know, what was his concerns. His concern was that he was in love with his best friend's wife. And he wanted me to teach him strategies how to win over his best friend's wife. <laughs> so, yeah, kind of how it was a bit like jaw drops. I said, okay, well, you know, it's, firstly, it's unethical as far as I'm concerned. And secondly, you know, that's not what I do as a job. And he was said, well, I paid you the money. You are there to give me advice. There's a woman I want to pursue. I want her. Why can you not help me uh, show her, persuade her that she should have feelings for me and not for her husband anyway? Needless to say, the session ended promptly. Um, I refunded him his full three session money. He then went and complained about me to both the British Psychological Society to which I belong and the Association for Coaches and if any other body <laughs> I belong to got complaints. All of them were turned down, of course. But, you know, there's always that, you know, it's a quick, instant decision. I, re I could have gone through that first session with him in some way or at least gone deeper and tried to find out why he had this infatuation perhaps with his best friend's wife and how he might take that and meet somebody else but I kind of didn't I just took the line that this was an immoral unethical thing to do so it was sayonara that client um so really, the, the top red flags, I think, that should make you think twice about taking on a new client. Okay, so one, unrealistic deadlines. You know, those people that just have no time. Uh, they don't have any time, but you've got loads of articles. Um, and just want everything done at their behest when they want it 24-7. Um, uh, the person who questions your rates, and I think it's probably fair enough that people will come to you and say, can I have a discount, um, you know, if I do X or Y, or just can I have a discount. Um, but if they're very unhappy with having to pay the price that they have, you have agreed to pay and you still feel they're unhappy, then resentment builds up because they're, they're never going to feel they're getting value for money. So look out for those people that just, you know, are a bit, off that they're paying more money than they thought they might and they can't let it go. Uh, people who fired their last wedding organiser or planner, I think it's worth saying if you ever talk to anyone else, because I have come across people you know, who fired, got rid of, left four or five before they land on a colleague's um, office and there is a reason why those previous uh, bakers, florists, whatever, whoever they are, have gone. Um, the people who suggest you don't get it, kind of, you may be married, you may not be married, but whatever, you don't get what they're feeling, you don't get how important it is to them, you don't get how much this matters to them. I mean, you kind of do, that's your job, and most of you, I'm sure, do it beautifully. But there are some people who are very resistant to acknowledging or passing over control uh, to somebody else. Um, because you are not them and you can't be them and you don't get exactly what they get however many times you talk to each other. Um, people who have uh, disorganised, unrealistic expectations from the start, you know, just are expecting the world at their feet, everything, everything, everything. You may not have the budget, you may not have the time, just things that are impossible to achieve by anybody 
you know, look for those flags. And then I guess when you've got couples that come to you um, together, whether they have very different opinions on what they want, that's immediately a difficult uh, working situation to be in. But also there's even little things like facial expressions, body language gestures, um, fidgets, crossed arms, heavy sighs, short responses, leaning away from you, looking you too intense in the eye, not having eye contact at all. I mean, little body language gestures, not individually, but in clusters, because there's always some anxiety, but kind of show someone who is perhaps impatient, um, dissatisfied with what you're saying. I mean, just, just look out for some of those um, little things. So, how do we deal with these people? Okay, so something that's very common in the coaching world, um, but also I think very applicable to your own businesses, is setting boundaries. So setting boundaries, I'll sort of read this out, it's easier, is a form of contract which spells out clearly and simply what you're offering, where the boundaries are, both in terms of your time and the financial agreement. If you're only available between set hours via email, only for example, make that clear. If you feel that you can be more flexible, say so, but again, spell it out. It's very often panicking clients um, who call you at odd hours and out of the kindness of your hearts and because you're good at your jobs, you respond. But they're the ones that will do it over and over and over again once they've gotten away with it once. So you need to have those boundaries. Uh, remind them of them if they start doing that. Um, you know, it's perfectly acceptable for you to say you'll help them where you can, but they, they need to know you have a life outside of work as well as other clients. Um, you know, and that's the way life is. Uh, you know, be assertive. You know, if control is being lost or clients are stepping over boundaries, um, sometimes people are unaware of their behaviour uh, and they need a kind of firm reminder of that. Learn to say no and mean it. It's a difficult skill for some, but it's absolutely essential. Make sure to say no to activities that might take up too much time or energy and cause your business to suffer because you know, one person taking over the expense of others is, is not a good way to run a business. Set expectations, especially in communications with clients. Uh, make a signature or footer on your uh, emails that identifies working times and when clients might expect responses, i.e. within four hours the next working day. Um, I mean, the more you can establish covertly your parameters, your boundaries, the way you work, the less likely they are to, to sort of start taking advantage of you. I mean, don't feel guilty about making boundaries. Um, clients might manipulate you a bit, make you feel a bit guilty about changing those things they don't like. Um, I mean, if that really does go on, and I'll come to that at the end, then they may not be the client for you. So there is a little bit I'm going to say about what happens when you that gets to the point where you have to terminate. Um, it's a miserable talk, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and make it more jolly. Um, when you have to sort of end the relationship. So something, again, I do a lot in my psychology world is managing expectations. It's really important to manage somebody's expectations so that their joy, their exhilaration, their thrill, their excitement. Don't pour any cold water on that, but just frame it within what is realistically achievable. And so, you know, that way uh, they all get off to a good start. I mean, working with any new client in any new business is going to be stressful. You have to get to know each other, find out what their expectations are on it early on. You know, you will have clients that are overbearing, clients that are needy. If any celebrities are out there listening to this, that's most of you. Um, uh, so it can be a strenuous relationship that's fraught uh, with problems from the start. So getting these issues in check early on is important to salvage the relationship and ensure that, you know, you work together the best way you can for the long haul. I mean, and in the wedding business, I don't have to tell you... It, couldn't be any more stressful, could it? I mean, it's the most important days of people's lives. Um, huge it, it's emotional, psychological, financial investment is invested in you getting it right, or a group of you, and that is the biggest burden to carry. So you have my every sympathy. <laughs> um, so my tips for managing 
helping manage clients' expectations so they feel you've done the best job possible uh, while keeping their expectations within the real world. And now these conversations need to be had at an early stage um, because if you, if a client begins to expect something that you know to be impossible, I know it's tempting to offer this to people who you know, excitedly want it, it just leads to disappointment. So it's not only their expectations that need to be kept real, but also yours. Uh, there's too much fluff in most business proposals, in my view. People love to overpromise. It's very easy. We all do it. I do it all the time. Um, you know, so be authentic. Talk to them about what you are willing to do for them, what you hope to achieve. Be transparent about the challenges and obstacles involved. I mean, don't do it so that they're going to go to somebody else because you make it all sound negative, but do it in a kind of light-hearted but firm way so that it's transparency, it's honesty. Uh, it's just more effective. You know, establish regular communication. Now, one thing I've had uh, often with my own clients, I don't know if you get it, is that there are so many ways to contact you these days. So I have a client who, I am pretty much available 24-7, that's because I'm an idiot. But most people don't want to do what I do. Um, but they'll send me a WhatsApp, don't answer that. They'll send you a messenger via Facebook, don't answer that. Send me a message, send me an email, phone me up, leave me a voicemail. I mean, there are so many ways to get in touch. So I think you need, it's good to establish what your business, not only the hours in which you'll respond, but also what you're willing to, um, to accept as a form of communication. I get DMs on Twitter, you know, saying, oh my God, I'm in terrible state, you know, like whatever, usually from celebrities. Um, can I speak to you now? Three o'clock in the morning? No, I didn't pick it up and uh, don't DM me on Twitter because like that is not for that. So I just allow WhatsApp and email. Um, so, you know, discuss with them the channel that they prefer, you prefer and stick with it. So uh, personally getting to know the client, um, showing you're a real human being can help you develop a strong business relationship understanding their values, their goals, their struggles, their interests. You know, all those things really matter. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever become friends with clients that you've had, whether that's something that's happened with the rapport and the relationship you've built up uh, through planning their wedding. I mean, I have become friends with the occasional clients I've had. In fact, I think I've spent more on going to weddings than I actually earned from counselling pre-marriage couples in the first place. However, it brings me joy. Um, but my view was, or is, you can't be friends with them until that process is finished. Don't start getting pally uh, in the middle of the process, if, even if the bride says, oh my god, it's so hectic, and you've been so brilliant, let's go out and get drunk tomorrow night. Um, kind of don't do it, because you don't want, it's fine after they're married, it's fine to do that, but beforehand you're kind of blurring business and personal relationships. Um, this is an obvious one, sign a contract. Um, you know, it sounds a bit daft when I put it like this. Um, but it is very, very important and early stage and get all those expectations down there of the bit, you know, your business, what it supplies. Um, Clear itemised lists. Again, this is about being transparent and honest. Really clear itemised lists of what you're going to do, what can be done for the budget. Clarity. Clarity. The more you can be clear about what you are offering and put those boundaries, those parameters in there, um, be absolutely precise, uh, the more they will, or less likely to become difficult. Um, Rapport. Okay. Now, obviously in my world, as a psychologist, as a counsellor, it's really, really critical that I have quite a deep and almost intimate emotional rapport with my clients, because if I don't, it won't work. And there are some clients who won't like me, and there are some clients I won't like that much either. Um, but rapport is sort of slightly different, as long as I can kind of feel I've got their trust, they can trust me, talk to me about anything. And I guess there must be people that you will come across who you won't take to. 
you know, you'll, you'll talk to them for a while and think, oh, God, it's Bridezilla, you know, whatever, and she's going to be awful, or I don't like her, don't like what she wants. Um, you know, if you can overcome it, and if you can get them on side, or if you can hear what they're saying um, and bring it into whatever you're doing, that's great. But, you know, if you, if you don't like it, if you feel compromised by it, if it's something you really don't like, I, I just think you should recognise that as another red flag and walk away. Not every wedding planner, organiser, florist baker, I keep coming back to those things, four things I know in weddings. Um, ring maker? No, I don't see any ring makers here. Um, you know, recognise it and, and don't be afraid to walk away. I know you want to build your businesses, but like it can be so counterproductive if you just don't feel the rapport with someone. So finally, I'm just going to go on to... Um, Dealing with a difficult client once you've committed to them, because I'm sure everyone has been in this position uh, for whatever reason. You wanted the business, sounded great, everything was okay. Then they became a nightmare. Okay, and they just become difficult. Uh, they might be asking you to cut your prices. They might be unhappy with what you do. They might be asking for the impossible. They might be changing their minds at a moment when it can't be changed. Whatever it is, difficult clients are out there. So be as calm as you can. Uh, try to avoid confrontation or worse, getting into any sort of conflict or row. That is always a no-no. Um, be aware of your physical state. So when you're starting to get agitated, your heart races, your adrenaline surges, you start to get fidgety, you start to feel that kind of dread. If someone asks you something really difficult, take your time in response. And also, I um, don't know if any of you practice mindfulness or meditation or anything like that. Um, but if you do, remembering that at the time when you're feeling really like you want to just kill them uh, <laughs> does help uh, just to pause that moment of anger. Um, something called ref reflective listening. I won't get too scientific on you with these tips, but this is how you can really understand their body language and their words. So if they say, I'll read this one, I have a limited budget, and you seem to be inflexible on a discount. Try repeating it back this way. So what I'm hearing is that our pricing is a concern for you. Your budget's a barrier. Tell me more so I can better understand your situation and how I might be able to meet your needs. I mean, that may not be a discount. It may be something else. But repeating back to them what they've asked, A, buys you a moment of time, and B, reassures the client that you are familiar with the issue that they have and you are just representing it back to them in your own way with consideration. Express empathy. Don't argue or make excuses. Instead, try to validate the client's feelings by saying, you're angry with me because, and even if it doesn't feel fair, apologise, tell the client you're sorry, even if you didn't do it, uh, that something has made them angry. That's very important, that you're sorry it's upset them, not necessarily you're sorry you've done something, um, or that they sorry that they feel you're not competent enough to provide the services they need. You need to de-escalate the situation when this happens. It may not be a long-term difficult client. They just are someone who's having a very bad day. And you are, because you are the provider of everything and all their anticipations at the sharp end of it. Um, use non-confrontational phrases like, let's try and bring some clarity to this. To this. What's that word, clarity again? Rather than let's thrash it out. Um, also helps sort of not make it seem so angry. Um, and another little trick that I use with counselling is mirroring my client's words sometimes or their postures. Because um, mirroring, which is just copying exactly what they do, they don't know you're doing it. <laughs> but it does make them feel kind of better. It has a sort of subconscious effect that makes them a little bit calmer. Uh, just a few more things and I'll wind up with some questions. So this little phrase, in my experience, IME, uh, it's a little trick phrase. Uh, it immediately redresses the balance to you as a qualified, experienced advisor and helps redirect the conversation to one where you regain control. So if someone asks for something, I I'm, don't want to come up with crazy ideas, but you know, 10,000 gold-plated balloons um, suspended upside down in their wedding venue. Well, in my experience, that might be too many for the size you're having. I mean, something that sort of pulls them back from fantasy 
hint a little tempting possibility of reality, but you are the one who knows. You are in control. Don't say, don't be ridiculous. That's absolutely impossible. Nobody would have that. They'd all fall down. Or it'll cost you 20 million. Just use your experience. Say that phrase. Um, reframe resistance. Some clients express what they want and then fight every inch of the way to make sure it's something different. Okay, I get this all the time. This is what I really want. You help them get it. They say, oh, no, I don't really want to do it. I don't want to do it that way. Um, they're resisting for some reason. If you get irritated by this, then there's a situation of conflict, again, where you're resisting each other, which makes it doubly bad. So talk about working together to get it as tight as it can be for the situation and the price. Uh, using measurables, again, use this a lot in psychology. Very, very specific. So if people say, this is not working, nothing's working. It's not happening for me. Timing's not right, expenditure's going out the window, whatever. You create a joint measurable focus of what can be done for the price and what time. Specifics are your friend when looking for solutions. Absolutely precise. Then we all know we're on the same page. So finally, um, okay, time. yeah, the miserable bit. This is really depressing. I feel like I'm giving a funeral address. Consider terminating the relationship. Okay, uh, I mean, this is your last port of call, isn't it, really? You've tried everything, you know it's not going well, it's, it's costing you time, money, and your professionalism with your other clients. So when all else fails, and that particular client is either taking up far too much of your time, making unrealistic demands, or just generally making the whole wedding a miserable place for all of you, then it is worth considering terminating it. If your every move is being questioned or challenged, it's unlikely you'll ever be on the same page or be able to work in harmony to their satisfaction. Um, if it's not too late in the process, it would be a good idea to explain this to them and suggest maybe they approach another wedding planner. Um, don't be intimidated. Don't feel bullied. Learn to recognise those moments when and it's not a failure. It's just it hasn't worked out for the two of you. I mean, it's like any relationship that's coming to an end, sometimes it just isn't going to pan out and it's nothing you could have ever have done to have changed that situation. So walk away with your head held high knowing that you know, there are other people out there who will work much better with. So that's really it. Don't want to end on a miserable note. So um, I kind of just want to go through all those points. So I'm happy to say, I realise there are no slides, so you can't remember anything that I've said. <laughs> But are there any questions? I'm really, really happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Joe. Good Thank you afternoon. very much indeed for your talk. Thank you. Um, I'm Audrey from Audrey Amity's Weddings. I have one question, and then I'll explain to you why I'm asking this question, if it's okay. So, in your opinion, is there a common trend in character in terms of emotional intelligence with celebrities? The reason I'm, uh, the reason I'm asking is because uh, I'm an ex-oil and gas lawyer and I created my own company organizing weddings and I attract lawyers, investment bankers, traders because I walk the walk, talk the talk and I know looking at their body language things that they like. If I say certain things, I know they will like it. I work for X company, I could see the bride looking at the groom like, oh wow, that's impressive. Or, so, and I've um, contacted a celebrity on Instagram and she replied back. Um, and I wonder, in your opinion, is there something that like lawyers, for instance, they love structure, they love the fact that I'm a member of an association, etc. Is there something with celebrities that they would be like, wow, that's impressive. Um, something different than obviously privacy, because that's very, very important to me. Thank uh, you. I think, yeah, you talked about emotional intelligence at first. I mean, the problem with celebrities, let's talk about that for a second, is that they get to a certain stage when they, they change. They're fawned over, they're used to being fated, lauded, photographed, charmed wherever they go, they get a sort of sense of entitlement. So I suppose my suggestion with celebrities is to suggest that you're going to indulge their every whim, that you understand that, you understand the world that they come from, that it's different to other people's worlds, and that's what you specialise in. You, you, it is patience at the end of the day, you may not want to put it like that, but just that you get how busy they are, how they may not be available at certain times that you are. Just recognise the world they're in, how it, 
how important it is to them to have you available. Yeah, I mean, you, celebrities do have a great deal of sense of entitlement, and they like to exercise it. So, yeah, don't put it quite like that, but just say so that you recognise that they are people who are shorter of time than most, and, and respond to it that way. Anybody else? Anyone else? And there's lots of celebrity weddings, of course, because they keep busting up, so there's always another one coming along. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone had a really, really difficult client who wants to just have some group therapy? <laughs> 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 Everyone. <laughs> Anybody else? I had a very difficult client recently. And none of my supplier wanted to work with her because she was driving everyone crazy. So at a certain point, uh, people start saying, OK, I'm dropping out of the wedding because she's just completely nuts. And she doesn't know what she wants. And we are you know, two weeks away. And we haven't, you know, she's keep on changing her mind. <clears throat> she was very frightened at a certain point that I would drop her as well. And she was really driving me insane, but I didn't want to drop her. And I had a fantastic relationship. But I had problem controlling her all the time because she was keep on changing her mind. So how, I mean, my problem wasn't with the client. No, but this is other people who wouldn't deal with her. Yeah, so, I was OK. but So I'm, she needed you. So what you've got is a codependent relationship. It's not ideal, but she needs you and you need her. You need to be the one who takes the control and you need to say to her and speak to her because she's scared of losing you. She doesn't want to go somewhere else. And say that and just say, okay, there's a few of the people that I need for my business, that I rely on, who are very good people, who are actually getting a bit frustrated by some of these things. So can we just nail this one down, make sure this happens? That will funnel it through you so that you deal with those other people. She doesn't have any direct contact. But take back control. Co codependent relationships can be very difficult because you're like feeding off each other and you two get on, but everybody else around you is finding it very stressful. Um, but take, take the control back in that relationship. Yeah, I, think, I think the supplier that, you know, I managed to keep everybody else, the other three, but one drop and said, look, I'm just not going to deal with that. How could I have pre prevented? Because that's obviously created a lot of problems, and I had to find new suppliers. Well, I think by you know, creating a buffering zone, anticipating that she's going to be difficult, sort of playing that sort of mediator would have been one way. But there are no absolute guarantees. I mean, these suppliers, you know, some of them have more patience than others, some of them have more business than others. You can't always contain every single person in the chain of events so sometimes it will happen but in order to prevent it happening sort of acting as if you are a mediator because you're understanding both perspectives is is sort of the way to go to help prevent it happening should i've done something different or well, i'd have to know your sort of detailed story really without knowing whether you should you might not. It might just have been the supplier thinking, eh, I don't need a bit of aggravation um, and, and walking away from it. Or it might have been something you could have helped mediate or recognise at an earlier stage, step in, diffuse the situation. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards about it, of course. Anyone else? <coughs> Andrew, the bottom. Hello, Joe. My, Joe, my name is Andrew. Hi. Um, I've noticed over the years that um, when people um, maybe have a problem or they're not happy, that they can express themselves in very different ways. Um, some clients might come to you and they're very appreciative and would you mind and could you do this and you know, we've, we, you know, we like what you've done, whatever. And other clients will, maybe they're more insecure and more right, worried, but they come on the attack straight away. That, that, you know, the way in which they try to leverage you to get something to do... Sorry, the way in which they leverage themselves in order to get something done is to go on the attack and yes. to sort of like find fault and say, you did this wrong and, you know, you, you know you've upset me and this has happened. And, and, and I think that it's quite difficult to deal when someone comes on on the attack from the get-go, and how would you suggest doing that? It's very difficult, because one of the reasons they do that, of course, it's not about you. It's about things, other things that are going on, but you are a very convenient person to offload on. And so they just go, 
they get angry or defensive or go on the attack on you because there's something else frustrating them that may or may not even be related, but you are someone to take it out on. I think remembering that, knowing that, thinking, okay, maybe this is not about me or anything I've done. This is because they are going through a difficult time. Again, it's that calmness. You know, take the control back, bring it back, find out, explore a little bit what it is. You're not a therapist. You can't be expected to go, unlike me, <laughs> right into the very reason why they're behaving like they are. But you, with experience, can kind of diffuse that a bit. Uh, but take some notice of the fact that it's not about you. So you don't need to defend yourself. You don't get into that situation. Well, I did my best. That didn't happen. Just it probably isn't about you, but you are a convenient person to have a pop at. Um, and it's an anxious time. You know, it's a lot of anxiety going on. They might not even want to get married. They might change their mind. They might have an affair. Who knows what's going on in their personal lives? So it would be, be unlikely for you not to get some of those people having a go at you about something else that you don't really need to know about. I don't take to heart. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Um, good afternoon. I'm Ragni, and I'm a doctoral researcher from the University of Warwick. And oh, what I, I basically... I went to the University of Warwick. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so basically what I do is I study planners from across the world. I've, uh, been in the US and I've been I'm in the UK because I'm studying here and I'm originally from India. So my question to you is, do you think or in, a, in your experience, how would you manage difficult, difficult clients in different parts of the world? Maybe the West and the East or uh, just per se different uh, countries. Uh, is there a difference? And uh, You how mean you when you them? haven't met them and you can only Skype them, for example, or FaceTime, or just the fact they come from different backgrounds? Yeah, the, the fact that they come from different backgrounds and how would you tackle different clients, difficult clients from different backgrounds? Yeah, I mean, that, that's really interesting because obviously what's difficult in one country is probably kind of standard in another. Um, in some ways, in terms of behavior and demands and how people express it. And I think, you know, do your research, sort of know, I mean, often you might not meet these people, so it's, perhaps it is only Skype, and then you don't, I do a lot of Skype counselling, but I never feel I have quite the same rapport um, that I do with people that I've met. But I also, for example, uh, work for one of the very big matchmaking agencies, and their clients come from all over the world. Um, and I do notice cultural differences. Uh, I mean, Americans, they come from France, Germany. I mean, basically, they speak English. They, they come to me for their sort of therapy for this matchmaking agency. And I just, through experience, kind of learn different people's attitudes, different the way people approach things. It's quite, it gets complicated, but it's interesting. But yeah, there are differences. And I think research experience, kind of recognizing that there are subtle, sometimes not so subtle differences in the way people approach things is... It's always good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? I think we are just about done. Thank you very, very much, Joe. Thank you.